All right, good morning again. Thank you guys for being here this morning. We're going to continue the series we started last week called The Narrow Place. And uh, we talked about last week about uh, the word Egypt in uh, the original Greek has two meanings. And the meaning is uh, Egypt. The other is Mitzrayim, which means narrow place. And so today we're going to continue talking about the narrow place. But before that, anybody um, forget that it was daylight savings time this morning? So, yeah. <laughs> I wish I did. I'm glad to be here. Glad you're here. Uh, yeah, also shout out to those watching online. Thank you guys for tuning in. If you want more about our church, you can go to our website, visitgodshouse.com. Okay, so this morning, I was laying in bed, and last night, my wife was out of town, and she got back, and I wasn't feeling real good. I was feeling, feeling kind of off. I don't know what was off in me. In fact, I was driving, and I told her I kept seeing things jump out in front of me. I don't know. I realized later I had been on my computer for like nine hours straight without my glasses. I forget those sometimes, so it could have been my eyes were like. Eh. So, anyways, um, Kelsey's like puts the essential oils on, and the the smell is next to my bed, and then she's like rubbing my back, and I like was out in like two minutes. And I I'm, I don't sleep long usually. I'm like a five to six hour sleeper, so that was at eleven. So I should have hypothetically been up wide awake at five o'clock this morning. But I wake up this morning, and I'm like, wow. It's light out. I must have like slept a little bit. This is awesome. Ah, this is great. Wow. Like, and I don't ever set an alarm because I get up so early. And I roll over in bed and I was like, oh, I should grab my phone and see what time it is. And it was 8.08. And I'm usually here at 8.15. And it would have been fine if we hadn't had the time change because it would have been 7.08 and it would have been a great morning. But it was the time change. And I was so confused. And I like went to Facebook and I started scrolling and Dave Taves had posted something about daylight savings. And I was like, oh! So then I thought it was 9.08, so then I like jump out of bed, ah! I'm like, Kels, Kels, and so we figured it was 8.08, and we got ready and got here just in time for leadership service. So anyways, if you, if you were that this morning, I totally understand because I'm right there with you, and in five years of being a pastor that like speaks on Sundays, this is the first time that one of the time changes has messed me up, so you know. Anyways, just thought I'd give you that little shameless plug, but really what I want to talk to us about this morning is how we always tend to miss the mark a lot in our lives, right? And things happen in our lives that we don't want to see happen. But there's something even deeper rooted that I think is bigger than even just being off at times. And that's our fears. Anybody here say, I got some fears in my life? I, okay, this is really great. So like, this is how you say it. Anybody got some fears around here? Thank you. Okay, thank you. So here's the deal. A lot of times in our lives, we are dealing with fear and whatever level that looks like, and we don't know how to confront it head on. And so this morning, we're going to look at uh, the Egyptians, and we're going to look at the, I mean, the Israelites coming out of Egypt and one of the times where they were facing some fears in their life and see what we can pull out of as truths in there. So if you've got your Bible this morning, turn over to uh, Exodus chapter 14, and uh, we're going to look at, actually turn to Exodus 13 first. I'm going to go back a chapter to explain something, and then we'll go to Exodus 14. So Exodus chapter 13, and uh, just look at verses 17 and 18 this morning. You guys glad to be at church this morning? Yes. All right. Wide awake. Wide awake. Thank God for coffee. All right, Exodus 13, chapter 17. When Pharaoh let the people go, God did not lead them on the road through the Philistine, Philistine country, though that was shorter. Hmm. For God said if they face war, they might change their minds and return to Egypt. So God led the people around the desert road towards the Red Sea. The Israelites went up to Egypt armed for battle. Now turn over to uh, chapter 14 of Exodus. And look down at verse uh, 10 through 18. As Pharaoh approached the Israelites, they looked up, and there were, there were the Egyptians marching after them. They were terrified and cried out to the Lord. They said to Moses, was it because there were no graves in Egypt that you brought us into the desert to die? What have you done to us by bringing us out of Egypt? Didn't we say to you in Egypt, leave us alone, leave us serve let us serve the Egyptians. It would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the desert. Moses answered the people, don't be afraid. Do not be afraid. Stand firm and you will see the deliverance the Lord will bring you today. 
The Egyptians you see today, you will never see again. The Lord will fight for you, and you need only to be still. Then the Lord said to Moses, why are you crying out to me? Tell the Israelites to move on. Look at the person next to you and say, move on. Raise your staff and stretch out your hand over the Red Sea to divide the water so that the Israelites can go through the sea on dry ground. I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians so that they will go in after them. I will gain glory through Pharaoh and all his army, though his chariots, I'm sorry, through his chariots and his horsemen. The Egyptians will know that I am the Lord when I gain glory through Pharaoh, his chariots, and his horsemen. Let's pray this morning. God, I thank you for your word. I thank you for um, having the Israelites go through what they went through so we can learn how to go through as well in our lives. I thank you for the way the story of of your life and your word unfolds in our lives, God. And I pray this morning that you would speak through me uh, to talk about our fears in ways that sets us free. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen and amen. This past week, um, I went out to the 1812 site to just go take a walk. I had a morning meeting that got canceled, and so I dropped Weston off, and I had three hours of free time, and a friend had said, hey, you should go check out 1812, like the property up there, and I never thought of that, so I got my GPS out, because I'm new here still, and tried to figure out how to get out there, and, and found it out. I, I found some other neighborhoods, too, if you're looking for a house, I could tell you where some are. I, I got off the track a little bit, but I got back on the track, and I finally made it out to 1812, and I got out there, and started walking along the river, and I am a water guy. Like, I love water. I'm a Michigan boy. We love our water. And so anytime there's water, especially when it makes noise like flowing or waves, I am just immediately like, ha. Ah. And so I just immediately out there, I was just like, ha, ah, and I just start walking down the gravel trails. Now, like I said, I um, went out there be- because a meeting got canceled, so I wasn't prepared for hiking. And if you know me, you know I'm kind of a shoe guy. It's kind of a little bit of an issue. We're working through it, though. It's, it's you know, Kelsey's, she's trying. It's been, it's been a little rough, but I love some shoes. And so I wasn't wearing shoes that you typically would hike in. I had these real cool, like, high-top guest brand shoes on that, you know, I got them at, at some store for real cheap, but 25 bucks at Ross, actually, if you want to know. But I just, you know, I give too much credit to people. But I, but I had my cool shoes on, and they're completely jet black. And I'm walking down gravel roads, now, if you know anything about gravel, when it hasn't rained, what happens to black shoes? Dust. And I don't like dust. We talked about dust a couple weeks ago. I'm not a big dust fan. And so I'm walking down the trail, and I'm walking very carefully, you know, looking at my shoes so they don't get dirty like this, trying to spend time with God, trying to pray. That's a great, very relaxing, I know, I know. I'm a very chill out kind of person. And I get to this point, this is the truth, I have to tell this, because this is how God gave me this message today. I get to this point, and I, I look up for a minute, and I see this point in the river. I don't know what it was, but it caught my eye where the river's kind of dividing, and there's this island out there, and it was just, like, oh, beautiful. And I thought, man, I should go stand out there. And, like, I should go stand out there. Now, I've done the coach training, and I didn't have my coach with me, So I start coaching myself, saying, you should go out there. (laughs) Now, it's not even like I had to walk through water. I just had to walk through some brush and some grass. But I had my cool shoes on. And so I stood at the edge of this trail. This is the honest truth. I stood there, and I went, I really want to go out there. And I felt the Holy Spirit say, DJ, just go out there and enjoy my creation. And I said, I would, God, but my shoes will get dirty. (laughs) And I heard God say to me, that is your problem. You are constantly looking at your reality and never looking out to me. And you wonder why you can't move forward. Well, I might be a chicken, but I am stubborn. And when the Holy Spirit tells me that is my problem, I am going to show him that it's not. And so this is what I did. I kid you not. I got to the edge of the trail, and I looked out at the place, and I said, I am not looking down at my shoes. And I walked like this out to the edge until I got there and looked. 
And when I got there, this was a really cool God moment. I really, if you don't, like, trying to find out how to experience God in your life, go on walks with God. Like, go do something different because it's so cool. I got out there to the edge of the river, and now I hear the river flowing, and I see the, the brush, and it's real pretty. And, and, and God said, now look back. And so I turned around, and I could not believe what I had just walked through. Because divas don't walk through brush, all right? People that get, care about shoes do not walk through areas where you get dirty. And I had come through this area that was probably about 100 feet long, and there was all these brush and all these twigs and mud. And when I got out there, my shoes were still clean. But I have no idea how I got from there to there without wrecking my shoes. And in that moment, God said to me, the issues that you face, the fears you face in your life are because you're constantly dwelling on the fear and you're not looking up to me. And if you would look up to me, I will walk with you through it. And yeah, there's some brush and yeah, you might bruise your knee once in a while or you might have to get new shoes, but it'll be okay because I'm also your provider, and if you need new shoes because you only have 43 more pairs at home, I can get you one. And I'm standing at the edge, and I was like, whoa, God, that is so much. Like, this was a real personal moment I'm just sharing with you. I was just like, man, that is so much my issue. And I was like, why is it that I constantly want to just stand on the ground where it's safe? And he said, because you think you own the ground. He said, if I want to take the ground out from under your feet, I could. And then I look out across the river, and God was starting to play with me. God loves to play with you. And he said, so what if I told you to go walk out in that water? I said, well, I'm wearing my light jeans today. <laughs> and those will get stained up. And he, it, was just, it was hilarious. I wish you could be in my head. And he said, you don't think I can get you new jeans? And it was one of those moments for me this week where we've had to make a lot of decisions for the church lately and have a lot of stuff going on in my family and a lot of things where I get news about something and I immediately dwell on what I have in the situation and how I can stay safe and how it won't affect me. And I felt like God said, stop looking down and start looking up. In order to confront your fears, you cannot dwell on where you are or what you have. Because you wouldn't have the fear if it was something you knew how to overcome on your own, right? You ever go through something and you've been through it on your own already and so you come up to it again and you're like, oh yeah, I've been here, done that, bought the book, wrote, you know, got the t-shirt, I can walk through it again, right? But when you get to a point that you've never been before and you're on the edge of something that you don't know what to do, it takes a whole lot of faith. And what happens to us so many times is we look down at the edge of the cliff and we start obsessing over what we're wearing or what we have or what we don't know and how much better it was back there. And we never step out to the wide open space that God has for our lives. This is where the Israelites are at this point. They've been in Egypt in slavery for all these years, and finally God sends Moses to deliver his people and to take them to the promised land, the land flowing with milk and honey. And I love in Exodus 13, he says, I sent them out, but I actually took them around the long route. Now, come on, God, if you're going to set me free, wouldn't it be easier just to set me free, right? If you're going to tell me I'm going to take you from here to there, isn't it easier for you just to take me and teleport me to there, and now it's all good and it's easy? And he says, I don't do that, because what he say in Exodus 13, 17, he said, um, if, I, if they go the short route and they face war, they might change their minds and return to Egypt, can I tell you this morning that some of the stuff you're facing, God's allowing you to face because he knows that if you wouldn't face it, you might go back to where you were and he doesn't want you to do that? And so some of the things that are confronting you right now in your life, the fears that you're facing in this very moment are actually there, God ordained. What? That's not usually what you want to preach. That doesn't get people shouting too much. It's better to say that you'll be delivered and by the time you get out to your car, there'll be a million dollars in the back seat and you're gonna have everything you need. 
But what if you get out and you got a flat tire and God said, hey, I need you to have the flat tire because the person that's going to come help you with that tire needs to know me. And I'm going to sit here with you and I'm going to develop you. And you're like, but God, I've had four flat tires in the last three weeks. Right? He's like, I know. And I could, I'm God, I could take the ground out from under you if I have to. I could cause you to walk on the water like I did with Peter. I could do what I got to do, but I'm letting you go the long way to get to where you need to be because as you go there, I'm trying to pull the narrow place out of you because you can leave Egypt and Egypt can still come with you. You can leave the place you're in and yes, you're out of there physically, but emotionally and spiritually and mentally, you're still stuck in that place. And so he says to the Israelites, I'm going to take you the long way around. And if you know the story of the Israelites, they're on this journey for 40 years. An 11-day journey took them 40 years. Some of us here this morning are frustrated because we haven't got what we thought we need in the last three weeks. 40 years to where they need to be. And so they come up to the Red Sea. And as they get to the Red Sea, what steps or strikes them immediately is fear. Because they're like, oh shoot, Pharaoh's after us. Because we got out of Egypt and he gave us a head start, but now he's coming after us. And had we just gone the right way, you know, the way we think we should have gone and not the God way, then Pharaoh wouldn't be catching up to us because we would have had a head start, but God took us the long way around. And so now we're, we're up to the Red Sea and here he comes and we hear his armies coming after us and God, what do we do? It's interesting how quickly you forget what God has done when you get to the next spot. Because they had just watched God deliver them out of slavery where they had been for generations and generations, slaves in Egypt, and they've been delivered and set free, and now a lake is their greatest fear. How many things in our lives do we watch God deliver us from and we get to the next thing and we're like, God, I don't think you can do it. God's like, really? 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 You, you, don't, you don't think I can provide for that kid that you prayed for six years to get pregnant for. Interesting. You, you, don't, you don't think that I can take care of you because you recently lost your job when I gave you the job in the first place and I'm just waiting to give you a better one. But in those moments, we're like, no, I can't do it. I can't do it, God, because you never come through and it's my next flat tire and it's always so bad. And God's like, what about all the stuff I've already delivered you to that brought you to this place? But your issue is, once again, you're looking down. And when you look down in front of a sea, it's a little scary. You see, they didn't know the story of Peter. Then if you know the story of Peter, there's this day where Jesus goes, and, and I'm not going to turn there, I'll just tell it, but walk. He, he, he goes out on the, on the, or his disciples go out on the lake, and, and they, they went ahead of Jesus. I don't know what happened. Maybe he was back getting some fish or something. And so they go ahead of him. And so he, he says, I got to get out to my guys out on the boat. And so you're Jesus, so you don't, nothing stops you. So he just goes and just like walks out on the water. And as they're coming, as he's coming towards them, they're like, oh my gosh, it's a ghost. What's going on? Oh wait, no, it's just Jesus. He's so crazy. Always trying to, you know, play these magic tricks or whatever on us. And so he, and so Peter, the disciple who's just like the bold one, like I'm going to show God, you know, kind of the me, like I'll show you, I'll walk with my shoes. And so Peter is like, yep, I got it. I'm coming, Jesus. I want to walk out there too. And so he gets out of the boat and begins to walk on water. But he's walking on the water looking at Jesus. And the minute he takes his eyes off of Jesus and looks down, he starts to sink. You see, the way we confront our fears is never looking down. Because the minute we start looking down and we see the sea, we see the sea, and we don't see the God who can rescue us from the sea or cause us to walk on the sea. And God loves to work things out in ways that you can't imagine. I mean, we're talking about Israelites here where he parted the sea so they could walk across. We're talking about Peter who walked on top of the sea. God doesn't care if you got to walk over it, through it, whatever. He will get you across it when it's time for you to get across it. The issue is that we stand at the shore like, God, hello. Okay, God's not here yet, so I'm going to work it out. I'm going to go over here and get some twigs and build a boat. And we're going to start going out there and, oh, my boat's sinking. What am I doing? Oh, God, help me. You're never, you're never there for me. You're never there for me. And he's like, why don't you stand on the shore and look up? And seek me and put your faith in me. And the more you put your faith and your hope in me, then I will deliver you. But it's not going to look 
how you thought it would look. I'm sure if the Israelites are out at the edge of the Red Sea and, and a boat comes by, they're like, thank you, God, finally, you're saving us. And these hundreds of thousands of people are like, I don't care how big the cruise ship is, they're not all going to fit on the boat. But in that moment, in their, in their small minds, and they're looking down at their own feet, they're like, oh, there's a boat. Thank you, God, we're going to be rescued on the boat. And God's like, keep looking at me. I delivered you not so you could be killed. Some of you have come out of some things in your life, and you've come out of addictions, and you've come out of sicknesses or diseases, or you've come out of bad relationships, and now you're at a point where you're in fear again because you're going, I don't, I don't know what to do, and it's like, I always end up in the same spot. And God's like, I took care of that back there, not so you could move forward and die. If I wanted you to die, I would have killed you in Egypt. If I wanted you in an abusive relationship, I would have left you in that one but you're not in it anymore. If I wanted to take everything you have away, I would have took it away back there. But the fact that you're still here, and yeah, it might seem like a longer journey, it may not seem like you are where you're supposed to be, just start looking up to me and trust in me, and you can face those fears. And so I love the, the, the Israelites come up to the Red Sea, and then God instructs Moses. It's a whole hilarious, I think this whole story is hilarious. A lot of the Old Testament is hilarious to me. Like, raise your rod. And like earlier he's told Moses, you know, to throw the rod down and it became a snake. And I mean, all these things. And he's like, raise your rod and the Red Sea will part. Now, you know, that's kind of believable, I guess, if you're thinking the Red Sea looks kind of like, you know, the river. Maybe the Red Sea looks like a little pond somewhere in someone's yard. We're talking the Red Sea. Like, we're talking, like, when, these, when this sea parted, there were walls of water as they're walking through. Now, you think that as soon as that sea parted and they start walking across on dry land, that as they're walking through these walls of water, there wasn't still some fear? I don't know about you, but sometimes when God opens the door for me to step into the new thing, I actually take the step into the new thing, and I'm like, oh, shoot. Because all I see now is the same water I thought I was going to drown in. And yeah, I'm not drowning. I'm actually walking in it or walking on it. But oh, shoot. Because the minute God takes you from the small place into a bigger place, it's going to take more of your faith to actually stay where he's getting you. And the reason that he allowed them to take so long to get there is because he needed them to see in the desert that he was their provider, that he was their sustainer, that he would get them through, that he'd send manna from heaven and he'd give them water out of rocks. He needed them to walk through all this stuff so that when they got to the point that they had to trust him as they're walking through the very thing that should have killed them, they didn't turn around and run back out of fear. Because that's what we do, right? Right? We run back out of fear. I have a friend that I was talking to this week who I've mentioned him before. He's my prophet friend. This guy in his 70s is awesome. And I, I called him the day I went out to 1812 and told him what I felt like God was saying to me. And he said this to me. And I said, oh, I'm going to have to preach that. He said, you do that, young man. So he said, DJ, you cannot walk in the supernatural if you're looking at the natural, right? We think a supernatural is like all the like gifts of the spirit and all these like crazy things and all this stuff. Like that is part of it. But sometimes a supernatural is God taking you and using your life and molding you and getting you to where he needs you to be. But in those times, the minute we look back down, we don't understand why it stopped. God, I was doing, it was doing so good and, and you were doing great things in my life and all of a sudden I feel like it has stopped. And God's like, it's because you looked back down at yourself and your own circumstance and if you want to face your fears, you've got to look up. You ever notice how looking up kind of makes everything feel better? I notice in times in my life where I'm feeling really stressed, if I go for a walk and I just go, wow. You know, it's, it's one thing to sit in here and be kind of stressed about how in the world these walls and things aren't going to fall down, right? Oh, please, Jesus. Please, Lord. Don't send the rain. We don't want the rain. But you go outside, right? And you're like, you can't even reach the sky. And it's so much bigger. And you go, oh, my gosh. God can do whatever he needs to do because I am this big. Looking up reminds me of how small I am, really. But then being reminded of how small I am, God comes in and begins to take me out of the narrow place 
and lets me know how big he thinks I am. He didn't create you to be small and do nothing with your life. He created you to step out and face your fears and be everything that he wants you to be, but you can't get there if you keep looking down. You can't walk in the supernatural if you're constantly looking at the natural. As we close this morning, if you're taking some notes, there's a couple things you could write down. One of the things is that when you give in to fear, when you look down, you're always running away from something you should be confronting. When you give in to fear, you're running away from something you should be confronting. Had the Israelites not had the strength to believe that God would open the Red Sea and even the strength to walk through and trust God, keeping their eyes on him as they walked through, they would have turned around, and when they turned around, there the Egyptians would have been, and Exodus would be done in chapter 14. We wouldn't have these stories to talk about because when you give into it, you're walking away from something you should be confronting. And the only way to confront your fear is to look up to Jesus and to move forward. Hebrews 12, 1 and 3, one of my favorite passages It talks about how when we face things, you don't have to turn there, I'll turn there, but it talks about how we need to fix our eyes on Jesus. It says, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, those who've gone before us, let us throw off everything that hinders us. God can get you those new shoes. What I realized in that moment this week was that I'm holding on to the very things that are stopping me. I'm not taking steps in my faith because I'm holding on to the things that I think I can take control of. And God's like, if I got to take those away, I could take them too. Let's throw off everything that hinders us and the sin that so easily entangles us. And let us run with perseverance. Whew, that's a strong word. What's perseverance? Keeping on, keeping on when it's hard. Some of you are so ready to throw in the towel this morning and God's like, just keep on keeping on in the moment. I can't promise you that when you leave here, it'll be better. But I can promise you that I'll walk through it with you. And then it says in verse two, let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. The next verse he talks about, consider him who endured such opposition from sinful men so that you will not grow weary and lose hearts. What's interesting about when you look up and you place your eyes on him and your faith goes back to Christ and you hold on to him with everything you've got when you're going through it, when you're looking to him and you fixed your eyes on him, you can face so much more than you can on your own. Because the minute, I promise you this, because I know about me and I'm very human, don't ever mistake people on platforms as something more spiritual. Stop into our house about Tuesday night when the dog has ticked you off, all right? The minute I stepped out there, if I had been looking down at the brush I was stepping into and the wet grass that were ruining my shoes, I never would have done it. But because I continued looking up towards the place I was going, not thinking about where I was, when I got there, I was there and turned around and couldn't believe how far I had come because I just kept my eyes focused where I was supposed to go. There's so many places you can go with fear, and we could talk about fear until we die. The number one thing I want you to know this morning as we leave this place is if you're in a place of fear and you're trying to figure out what to do with it, you can't figure it out. So fix your eyes on Christ and hold tight to him and let him take you from the narrow place you're in to the wide open space that he's called you to be in. That is the first step to walking in to your fears. Let's pray this morning. God, I thank you for your word. I thank you 
for even the things you give us in our lives where you remind us of your faithfulness, God. And you remind us of our selfishness or the, the things that we're holding on to that, that are hindering us from walking forward into what you have for us, God. Lord, a stupid shoe analogy seems so whatever. But God, there's some of us in this room this morning that are looking at things in our lives and telling God, I can't give up that 401k because if I give that up, what about my retirement? And I, I can't give up that job to walk into ministry even though I know you're calling me to because if I, if I give that up, I, I don't know what if I'll have my security or I, I can't walk out of this abusive relationship because if I walk out, there might not be anyone else there for me or I, I, I can't actually go do the thing you're asking me to do because whatever it is, and I pray, God, today that whatever we're facing, that we would just start to look up to you, that we would fix our eyes on you, the author and the perfecter of our faith, and that we would not grow weary because our eyes are on you and you are our strength and you are our portion and you are everything that we need and you will provide for us and you will give us every single step if we simply focus our eyes on you. And so I pray this morning, God, that you would help us to leave our fears behind and to step forward with courage, even when it feels bigger. God, I pray that we'd be a church that just does it afraid, doesn't have all the answers, doesn't know, but we know that when our eyes are on you and you say go, we go no matter what everyone else thinks, no matter what our mind is telling us, no matter what our past is trying to convince us that we can't handle. I pray that we'd fix our eyes on you and we'd move forward into the place that you have for us. And I thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen and amen and amen. Will you stand with me this morning? Awesome. Thank you guys for being here. Julian, brother, let's close this out. Have a great week, guys. Awesome, awesome.